Okay, folks, this is going to be our very first video review of the game and also happens to be the very first video where I do a voiceover instead of just record live as we go. So hopefully this will work out really well. Uh, this this video is is to show you a lot of the positive changes as well as a few negative changes and, and a few, eh, you know, uh, middle ground, not good, not bad changes that have happened over the last year since the majority of the population pretty much disappeared after the first month of playing the game. And I'm going to explain a little bit of the history as to why that happened. So here we go. Let's start with the positive changes. Positive changes over this year is an, a very extensive list, and I'm happy to say that the list of positive changes is actually higher than the list of middle of the road changes and the middle of the road changes is higher than the list of bad changes very few bad things have happened to this game in the past year but they are worth talking about because there are a few things so let's get right into it positive change number one ships can now extract resources that is a huge deal that's actually not something many of the players thought about because uh, originally when the game came out on early access back in 2016 uh, I think it was early November you had to extract using your settlement only well that's tough because uh, if you've played the game you'll know that settlements cost a lot of money and so only people with real-world money invested in the game could even extract resources if you didn't have real-world money well there really, really wasn't anything to do at all you were <laughs> you were bored out of your mind there was nothing so they have improved that by putting in ship extraction now even noobs can actually self-produce it's a huge huge plus in the last year and it's unfortunately that it wasn't out when the game first came to steam it would have retained a lot more customers i think positive change number two second character is now free so in the past your first character was free obviously because the game is free or at least it's free to play in, in one of those models but your second character and every character after that costed more and more gold to create well they've changed that now where your second character is also free that's a that's a pretty cool thing right there um, third item on the list task stacking via multiple players what that means is now you can actually have a friend come to your base and queue up a whole bunch of jobs and you at the same time can queue up jobs as well and they do not overlap they actually stack together so both jobs will kick off at the same time or over each other whatever you want to call it and um, you, you don't really have to uh, uh, worry about you know okay I want to make a thousand iron well that's gonna take me all day because I gotta sit here and click buttons that no longer is the case you can queue up a lot of stuff over a lot of characters what some people do is they make alts which is uh, extremely beneficial in that sense that you can put out a ton of production via alts so something very positive there next on the list number four is unique portraits now those already existed when this game came in 2016 but they were very limited and uh, i think they were all bought out at some point well they've added a whole bunch more portraits this is actually one of the things that i think do make sense when it comes to paying real world money is these portraits are unique pieces of art, meaning you would be the only person to have that portrait if you bought it. Downside is it's extremely expensive. It's somewhere in the range of like 60 US dollars if you factor out the gold to dollar ratio. So, I mean, 60 bucks, but on the bright side, I mean, it's, imagine if in other games you had a unique portrait that no one else could have and it was created specifically for you by a professional artist. That's kind of cool. But, um, you know, it's not necessary. It's, it's totally up to you. So next in the list is going to be increased capacity for most ships. That means that almost every ship in the game has been buffed as far as its carrying capacity goes. I think the only one that hasn't are the noob ships, the uh, noob balloons, the sutler, and the, um, the shibe. They hold the same as always, but they're noob balloons. You're not meant to be in them for very long. So that was a, that was a pretty cool thing that they've increased capacity. Now, achievements and tasks is a huge step forward in the right direction. This is one of my favorite improvements over the last year is there are now achievements, meaning that uh, it, let's say achievement level one is mine, I don't know, 100 tons of, of resources, which won't take you too long. And then the next achievement, once you finish that, is mine 500 tons, and then it gets progressively more difficult, but each level 
gives you more money. So in the past, the only way to make money was to do contracts, which didn't pay anything really, or to invest real world money, which again is goes back to why the game failed miserably in its first month. The, the game was released to the general public. It's an early access game, but I mean, everything's early access these days. So it was released to the general public. People came in and within minutes they realized if they got over the learning curve in the first place, there's no way for me to get ahead unless I pay real money. When you do a free to play game, you need to be able to convince the players that they don't have to pay while still being able to convince those who are willing to pay. If you pay, it's a lot easier. It's a difficult line to walk. I personally am not very fond of that pay model, but it is what it is. It's what we've got. So we just kind of deal with it. So they fix that a lot by putting in achievements and they also have daily tasks and weekly tasks, which also pay you. Those are all very beneficial. They are uh, helpful for any level. They, they level with you. So the tasks won't be monumental for your level. And if they are monumental for your level, they pay just as well as a task that's extremely difficult for a higher level would be. So that's, that's a huge bonus. And I'm hoping that that's moving them toward putting missions into the game because that would be the next logical step in my opinion. Next up is going to be contract and consumer good payouts. Now, I just mentioned earlier that consumer goods contracts, they don't they didn't really pay anything. They I mean, they were horrible. They were pointless. So people left the game. There was nothing to do. There's no way to make money except for with real money. Well, they've changed that now. Contracts actually pay really, really well. Uh, well, I, I, I guess I'm overstating it. They, they pay pretty dang well. If you spend enough time, let's say 20 to 30 hours of gameplay time overall, you can get yourself into the millions of silver. It just takes a little dedication, but it's much, much better than it used to be where you just couldn't do anything. No matter what, no matter how hard you worked, you could not make it. That was a huge determining factor in why almost everyone left the game. So that has been fixed. Keep that in mind, because that is a huge thing. I think that was the number one complaint was the inability to make money in the game, which has been, I'd say, 90% fixed. Next up, consumer good payouts. I forgot to mention that, actually. Um, consumer goods also pay more. It's still, I think, a little short of what it needs to be. Um, it, to do a consumer good run across half the world is only going to, if you have 12 tractors, for instance, is only going to net you maybe... 800,000 which sounds pretty good and it is but 800,000 for three hours of commitment eh, not so good when I could do one hour of commitment in uh, in a contract run and make even more than that so I'm hoping that they slightly increase the consumer good payouts and uh, maybe add a little bit more variety there they've mentioned that they might be doing that next up is going to be uh, demons, the things that lift your ship. Originally, they would determine how fast or slow your ship would go up and down. Well, now they determine um, horizontal speed as well, which is really cool. Uh, horizontal speed, meaning the higher level demon you have, the faster your ship will go. And it actually is the base of the equation that determines how fast your ship goes. So before anything else is calculated, the level of your demon is the first thing that they check. So having a max level demon in your ship is a big, big help. Your ship can probably get 30, 40 miles an hour faster just with the demon alone. That's a big, good upgrade right there. Uh, another one, settlements now include some goodies, meaning when this game was out late 2016, you bought a settlement, say a multi-purpose settlement, and it came with nothing. It was just a settlement. It would plop down the flight center would build and that's it. That's all you had. You had to go get all the resources. You had to get the telephones and all these little extra upgrades just to get your base running. Well, that is no longer the case. The game now gives you things like uh, 10 pound cannons and ammo, some telephones, a telescope, a couple crystals and armor, and a few things I can't remember. I think some resources to build a few initial buildings on it. So they've added a lot more bang for your buck for those settlements. And uh, one downside, although I should wait till we get to that point, is um, the settlement prices increased tenfold. So, you know, the least they could do was obviously give you more for what you paid for them, which they did. And I still think it sucks that everything costs as much as it does. But anyway, we'll get back to that. We'll go to that later. Let's stick with the good news first. Okay, Glide. Glide is probably number two on my list of the most important updates they've done this year. With Glide, 
the biggest complaint, which was everything takes a god awful long time, has been destroyed. Well, I mean, things do take a long time still because it's a massive map. No matter what, you're going to have a massive map to cross unless you use sapphires, which is the equivalent of going through a warp gate in EVE Online or doing a fast travel in virtually any other MMO. So uh, Glide, what that does is it makes your ship go three to four times faster than it's rated to go, depending on what your skill level in it is. And it uses mana, but you can get around that by getting mana potions. There's all sorts of cool things to do or smaller ships you can use. I mean, I can get a Negotiator, which originally went, uh, I'd say 140 with a really good engine. I can get it to go 560 now with Glide. So Glide is a huge help. It's like Fast Travel or Afterburners or whatever you want to call them. So Glide, very, very positive. If you haven't been in the game since they've implemented Glide, I suggest you give it a look. It is a huge game changer as far as time goes, because I know we don't all have tons of time. Next is ship insurance. That was kind of a no-brainer. I don't understand why it took them so long to figure it out, but I'm glad that they finally did. They put in insurance, which is exactly the way it is in EVE and other games where you have vehicles. You pay um, a small amount of silver, which is pretty small. It's not too painful. And if you lose your ship, you lose all the components in that ship, but you get a new ship of that same exact model back. That's especially useful if you've captured, say, a harpoon which is the most rare ship in the game and very expensive or a toad 200 or you know one of these ships that are really expensive to build or take you know a week and a half to make you can get insurance and instantly have another chassis and get out and go fight again big 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 good update right there next prospector and mammoth are are some of the coolest things they've done to ships now they've put in specialized ships i'm not going to talk about those because those are in the eh not so interesting changes, but they've got, they've got the new ship, the Prospector, which is the mining ship of the game. And this shows a direction that the devs are starting to take toward specializing, towards putting in specialist ships. That was another complaint a lot of people had was all the ships are kind of the same thing. I mean, some are bigger than others, some are faster, some are slower, but none really specialize in anything. The name of the game is get the biggest most armored ship and go pvp that's the only way to win and that was a huge complaint of a lot of the american and other english speaking players that caused them to leave the game was when we did start pvping we quickly realized there's only one ship you could really pvp in and that was the uh toad 200 yeah you could do the toad 100 which was faster and more maneuverable and it could shoot rockets out the side but it would still get almost instantly killed by toad 200 with a really good um, pilot in it. Now that's no longer the case. There's ships like the Harpoon, which is a Blade 100, but much more maneuverable and has forward firing missiles. There's now the Prospector, which obviously isn't for fighting, but it specializes in mining. Now another change that they literally just made last week before I recorded this. Last week they made a huge change to the Mammoth and the Paladin, which if you're a returning player, you might recall those are the ships that carried a whole lot of Strex. They were balloons, kind of slow. They carried, uh, I don't know, like 17 Strex or some odd number. Well, now they carry 25 Strex. And they're starting to specialize this ship towards being an actual in-game carrier. Another huge step towards putting specialized ships in, and I hope that they keep it up by adding more. Um, okay, so next, this is both a good and a bad change. New Reputation. So, um, you've probably seen my 2017 tutorials, or maybe even my original ones I did back in 2016, towards the end of the year, where if you kill a dragon, you get one or two um, faction points. If you kill another one, you get one or two more, and pretty soon you, you get tens of thousands of faction points because you're just sitting there auto-killing dragons with your automated turrets. Well, they've changed this. Now, killing dragons does not get you reputation, at least not automatically. If you're sitting there with your turrets on auto and they're firing, it doesn't do anything. It kills them, but you don't get any reward for it except for the loot that they drop. Um, originally, this kind of upset me. I didn't like this change. I thought, you know, why would they nerf this system? Because now how am I going to get faction points? Not that they do much yet, which we're hoping changes soon. But I mean, what's <laughs> now he can't get any faction points unless I do contracts. Well, I found out that you can get faction points actually by shooting things manually. So if you put a gun into manual fire mode and you shoot at a dragon, you get a ton of faction points. Originally, it was always one or two. Now it's like 25 to 50, depending on the dragon that you kill. 
that is huge. That means that you have to participate. You have to participate more in um, killing things or, or participate more in getting yourself faction points. I actually have come around to believing that's that's a good thing. I don't really like AFK earning so much in games because you want to feel like you've done something. You, I hate games like. For instance, Star Wars Galaxies was a great game. Don't get me wrong. It's actually one of my favorite games of all time. But one of the things that bugged me the most about that game was people had created these macros where they would go to the most rare places on certain planets, like the Geo Caves, if any of you remember those, and they would just camp out these high-level bosses, and there was nothing you could do because they had these macros so fine-tuned that the moment those bosses would spawn, they'd instant kill them, and they'd get the loot for it. That is the downside of AFK macroing. So the devs are trying to remove that particular avenue, and I'm totally cool with it. Took me a little bit to come around, but I think it's a good thing. Next up, um, many, many English fixes. Now, I know those of you who are playing right now are probably laughing at that because <laughs> there's a lot still in the game that is very poorly translated, if it's translated at all. And, I mean, the pirates are a perfect example. They, they say a lot of ridiculous stuff, you know, and... They, they say things that don't quite make sense in English. Like, you, you understand what they're saying, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, I'm happy to report that they are fixing that, and they aren't just saying that they're going to fix it. They are fixing it, and I'm going to pat myself on the back here. I'm actually the person who's fixing it. Uh, they've given me permission to go in and fix all of the English text in the game. I'm very honored to do this, and I, I must remind you, I don't work for DIP, so you'll hear my opinion on things I don't like about them, but I am very happy that they've allowed me to do this. I've already seen some of the fixes showing up in the game. Some of the pirates are starting to make a little bit more sense when they talk. Um, some of the menu items make a little bit more sense, so it is improving. It will improve slowly because they review all of the English fixes, and there's, like, uh, from my last count, almost 3,000 lines of English, meaning each line is a different phrase or a different explanation or sometimes even one word. So you're going to see a lot more English fixes in the next few months if I have anything to say about it. Up next, city production buildings. This is another way to make noobs feel like they've got some way to get ahead without paying real money. And this is true to a certain extent. Now, it you can't really make much in city production buildings. They are the equivalent of level one buildings in a multi-purpose settlement. But that's, you know, a pile of buildings more than you had in the past now, isn't it? In the past, you had to buy a multi-purpose or a castle or a mill or whatever in order to do anything. Now, you don't have to worry about that. Now, you've got this awesome ability to at least make level one guns, make level one uh, armor plates and all these other cool things right from the capital cities. It's a good way to introduce new players to how the production system works without them having to invest a whole bunch of money but it keeps them from being able to do too much without buying a building. So you see this whole balance of free to play with uh, pay to win, which we'll get into in a minute here. I don't wanna ruin it for us all. Okay, up next, world map. This was another, this wasn't a killer of the game for us, for many of us who left originally, but this was one of our biggest complaints, was the world map was really annoying and difficult because you had no idea where you were on the world map except for a tiny little icon on the bottom of your screen that would say what sector you were in. You then had to pull up the map and you had to kind of trace your fingers on your computer screen and find out where that sector was. Now, in defense of that old system, it was kind of fun. It had kind of an adventure feeling of, oh, wow, I'm finding myself on the map. I'm, I'm using cartography. I'm actually using my brain to to communicate with other people, that was pretty cool. But all in all, it was really more of an annoyance than anything because those of us who had played for a while, we knew how to find ourselves on the map and it just took up time and got in the way. Well, they've changed that now. Now, every bastion shows up on the map, which I'm gonna talk about those in a minute here. Um, every territory shows up on the map and most importantly, you show up on the map. There's a flag on the map indicating exactly where you are and even better, you can click anywhere on the map and set a waypoint, and the waypoint will show up on your mini-map. You can fly to that place. That is such a massive improvement over the original and something that irked me, and I hated it so much that I had to kind of guess the general direction of where something was, or I had to have something in that settlement in order to fly to it. Now I can just click wherever I want to go, and my ship can point right at that waypoint, 
with a little WSAD action and go. Very good, and let me just say thumbs up to you developers. That was such a simple fix that I really wish you would have put in the game before you put it on Steam, because that would have probably saved a lot of, of headaches for everyone else. Okay, up next. And we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, I think five more good points, and we're going to move on to the stuff that's maybe not so great. So up next, destroyed buildings no longer disappear when they're destroyed. Now, if you've ever PvP'd or you've destroyed a building, you see what happens is you hit it, it goes away, and there's a huge explosion of everything that the building was made out of and everything that may have been in it. Well, that explosion still happens, which is cool if you're a pirate, because it's like instant payout for doing something really piratey and nasty. You get to see all these awesome goods explode all into the air and you get to go loot them. But the building that you destroyed remains as a shell. Um, that is good for people who own the buildings because uh, maybe they had a really cool layout in their castle or in their multi-purpose settlement or, you know, whatever the case may be. And they don't want to have to try to re-click on every, every type of building and move it back into the right spot. Now all those buildings remain and they can just hit a button that says repair building. I think that's cool. Some people might not like that change. Go ahead and tell me in the comments if you like it or dislike it and I will not care about your opinion. Okay, up next. Players can no longer shoot caravans. Um, this was originally a bummer for me because we, we found this exploit in the game. In fact, I think myself and one of, uh, one of the, my fellow Gorgonites, my guild, one of my guild members found this exploit that you could set a building underneath where caravans go and then you set the caravan to enemy and your building will just launch everything it's got at these caravans and take them out without ever taking damage. It was really fun for a while. <laughs> we got a lot of cool loot from it. It was, uh, it was definitely good for us, but it wasn't so good for the developers because it was obviously an exploit and they did fix it. It's good that they fixed it because it wouldn't be fair to players who don't have settlements because, you know, they can't they can't put a settlement down and shoot down free kills and get a whole bunch of loot. So I am glad they fixed it. I'm also kind of bummed. Sort of 50-50 on that one. But I understand why they did it. Okay, up next. Strek and Torp armor. One of the problems with Streks in the past was you had to put a crystal on it in order to keep it from dying instantly. But if a player used lightning and had the skill stiletto, which lets you break through shields or crystals, whatever you want to call them, then you could instant kill a strike because they have very little health overall. It's like 10 to 50,000 depending. Well, now they have strike armor, which is pretty fun to play around with. You can put it on bombers. You could put it on two seater strikes even and, and sort of play around with the designs. So I'm happy they did that. And also they have armor for torpedoes so now if you want to launch a torpedo at someone and they try to shoot it down with lightning which is the typical defense for a torpedo well if you're using an armored torpedo that lightning isn't going to be enough and you're still going to hit them this is also a noob friendly change because in the past if we tried to pvp a high level player and we were lower level because we just started playing um, we were pretty much screwed because every time we'd launch a torpedo he just lightning it out of the sky and he had tons of of uh mana so he could just keep on lightning these things as they came and we never could get anything through and never could cause any damage it was extremely um, frustrating so i'm glad they fixed that they still have normal torpedoes which can be destroyed and which are cheaper to make but now they have armored ones which take a lot more effort to, to blow out of the sky so good on the developers for doing that one um, now they've added this thing that i call the pyramid scheme there's no other way to put it because it's a textbook pyramid scheme where if you invite a player to the game because you're given a code, um, uh, you invite them to the game, they get a reward of some medallions which give them free skills and you get the reward of every hour that they play, you get five gold. Some of you remember they used to hand out five gold an hour if you played no matter what. They don't do that anymore. I kind of wish they would bring that back because I think that was actually a pretty cool feature. But... Uh, now they've got pyramid schemes, which really suck in real life, but in the game they're great because we get free stuff. And if you really want to utilize it, you sign up under another player who then, and then you sign someone up under yourself, you sign someone up under them, and you go down the pyramid five levels, you get rewards for every person in that pyramid. I don't think I'm going to go any further into explaining what the pyramid scheme is, <laughs> because I think that you... You understand it if you know what a pyramid scheme is. Um, in fact, I will link for you my number 
uh, my invite code at the in the description of the YouTube video that this is going into because heck I want your gold too and I want to give you free skills well that's kind of a lie I don't really care about your skills I just want your gold but you do get something good out of it so you know come on help me out here all right next thing two more good items and then we're gonna move on new balloons this is a real quick one they've just updated the look of new balloons they look kind of cool they have little flames on them now I don't know I just think it's cool but aside from that it's kind of a pointless fix but I'm okay with that I, I'm okay with graphical updates I never complain um, next and last thing which just got put in I mean it just got put in a day ago I think maybe two days ago from when I'm recording this remote loading and unloading of things so they had remote unloading for a while there I think four or five months now but remote loading is a brand new concept that is something that they've not put in yet uh, so what that does is it makes it so that you can land a ship somewhere and let's say you have a settlement that has got a ton of iron in it but it's across the map so you've sent your ship over there it's landed and now you want to pick up all that iron and bring it home but you don't want to fly all the way over there to do it because you've got other things to do and as I mentioned before the world map is enormous well now you can now there's a button to do that and I'll probably explain that in a different tutorial or you can just you can look at it um, in the patch notes for uh, I want to say January 26 2018 somewhere in that general vicinity anyway pretty cool feature and um, in the same in the same uh, thought pattern as that feature is the ability to remotely land ships. Uh, you might remember that if you want to land a ship somewhere, you have to be able to visually see it. It has to be on your minimap, which is roughly 20 miles wide, or you have to have a ship at that settlement. You have to launch it, then you have to tell your other ship to follow it. It's just kind of annoying and it's kind of a mess. Now you don't have to do that anymore. You just shift click on land and a list comes up of anywhere, any city in the world or any settlement that you own and you can land your ship there automatically. Very cool update. I'm very happy. Their last two big updates have been very positive and I hope that they keep up that momentum because anyone who's played in the past knows that oftentimes the developers would do one step forward, two steps back and that was the thing that caused a lot of us more veteran players who did stick around for the first few months to finally say, you know what, we're done, we're out. So they're doing a lot of positive changes. Okay, now, part two. These are what I call the meh changes, meaning meh, not so great, not so bad, I guess. I kind of mixed, mixed feelings on them. Yacht and K model ships. So these are new ships, and I do like that they're adding new ships because there needs to be more variety. And as I mentioned earlier, we want more specialty ships. These ships are not specialty, really. They are kind of pointless. The yacht is just for bragging rights. It's a fast ship. It doesn't really do combat very well, but it looks pretty. It's white, and it looks like a yacht, literally, with jet engines. Um, the K model ships were not really a big improvement over the Toad and Blade 200, so virtually nobody buys them. They're kind of pointless on the market the way they are. Maybe the, the devs will further specialize those ships, but for now, they're kind of kind of pointless now there's other ships that you can buy there's uh the dominator i hear is actually pretty good but uh yeah my main complaint is the yacht and k model ships they're not bad they're just not good i i just feel like the devs could have spent their time on something better or at least could have spent more time making these ships more unique <clears throat> but you know no big complaint for me all right next one price change for additional characters they increase the price by quite a bit now each additional character costs, I think, 10,000 more gold than the last. I think it was five grand before. I might be wrong. I might be remembering it wrong because it's been quite a quite a long time. But um, I don't feel bad or good about this. I understand why they have the price as it is because they don't want people making a million alts and breaking the system. But it also kind of feels like just a grab for more cash. So, eh, yeah, I'm kind of neutral about it. It doesn't bother me enough to be angry. Um, next thing, this one, this one actually kind of bugs me a bit. Instant finish price is heavily increased. And I'm talking about skills. Instant finishing skills is pretty much just, you can't do it unless you have an, an incredible amount of money and you're willing to throw real money into the game. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Then instant finishing skills is just pointless and super expensive. If I want to finish a three day skill, it's something like 12,000 gold. In the past, it was like maybe a thousand or two thousand gold. 
and that was actually how I got my character leveled up a lot is I I had some gold and I leveled him up quite a bit that way and we caught up to a lot of the veteran players from Russia who had been playing for years and I'll cover that in just a minute so I understand why it's increased but again it sort of feels like a cash grab more than it feels like it's something to help the game so that's my opinion if you disagree that's totally fine I can understand both sides of that argument next they added bastions or bastion or however you say that word um, I think that's a good change sort of in the sense that in the past to own territory you had to have the most settlements in it from your guild so my guild actually became the owner of uh, Stoneland because we had so many American and other English speaking members who joined up in the first few weeks of the game we all started settling all over this territory and it flipped it became ours it was real exciting we were all happy all right wow we own territory we didn't even do anything and then the previous governor of the territory well, he wasn't so happy. <laughs> he came in and he bombed the crap out of everything we owned. And uh, in those days, losing everything you owned was a huge deal because we had nothing. We were brand new to the game. The game was new to most English speaking players. So that was a huge thing that got a lot of people to quit the game right there too. It was a real hostile environment in the early days. They've changed it now to where there are citadels or bastions, whatever you want to call them. Think of it like uh, the citadels in EVE Online where, you know, you have to destroy it and then it goes into protection mode for a little while. Then you got to try again. It's kind of the same thing. It's just an airship version of that. I think that's a good thing because then a whole bunch of us can occupy a territory that maybe we don't necessarily want to take from the owner or maybe we're you know going to take one day when we're ready but we don't want to take it we just want to live there and this is a way to do it without antagonizing the current governor but when you are ready to take it you can attack their bastion which is another way of saying i'm ready to do battle i'm ready for pvp so when he comes to fight you you're ready for it and there's a real good pvp instead of a slaughter so i think that's more of a positive change i probably should have put that in positive but um I'm kind of indifferent either way because bastions are for collecting taxes, which was which worked when you used uh, settlements to extract things. But now that you no longer use settlements to extract things, it, taxes don't really happen. They're kind of pointless. So bastions are more for bragging rights, saying I own territory. Look at me. So, I don't know. It's a good and a bad thing, I guess. Um, skill changes. They've added a new skill tree. Most of our original skills are still there. They're just sort of reorganized. They look a little better, but uh, there's a whole bunch more skills for the prospector now. There's a whole new skill tree for that. Um, I'm not really fond of the new cost of skills, but we're going to get into that when I get to the bad changes. So the skill tree I'm pretty neutral on. It does look a little nicer. Um, it's a left to right instead of a top to bottom. So most of us who read in the English language will appreciate that. Nothing else really to say about that one though. Um, they've done a defense crystal price increase. Now I this both makes me happy and upsets me. Originally defense crystals were I think 10 gold a piece for a 10 carat, which is the maximum. It's a million damage basically that it covers. Well, now it's 100 which sucks I mean, it's a lot of gold and it adds up like a single ship can fit five defense crystals along with its navigation system so that's 500 gold that's a payment right there of i think like 20 cents which doesn't sound like much but if you have a bunch of ships or you go fight a lot it's going to add up to be a lot of money really quickly now there's two ways that this could be resolved in my opinion this is totally my opinion right here um, one way is get rid of defense crystals altogether, which is a very unpopular opinion. Most people don't like that idea. I'm personally fond of it because I'd like the game to be faster paced and ships to be destroyed more easily, but they'd also have to make ship building more easy and quicker. They'd have to make resource extraction quicker. They'd have to make everything else quicker to compensate for the fact that ships can be killed easily. So I'm okay with taking crystals away, but only if everything else is sped up. Now the other option is just bring the price back down because come on, 100 gold, that is just ridiculous. That's just nuts. Um, I don't know if they'll ever do it, but I if they're moving towards getting rid of crystals by doing it this way and then eventually getting rid of them and increasing the speed of everything else, I'm okay with it. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see what they're gonna do with that. Uh, next thing is the tutorial agent. Her name is Alice. She's sitting on the side of your screen when you start the game now. You click on her and she pops out and gives you advice. Right now, that advice is kind of useless. She, You basically tell her, oh, I want to be a delivery boy. 
okay, we'll do contracts, is more or less what she says. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, well, thanks, I guess, for that little bit of information. I could have probably just asked anyone in game. So right now, she doesn't really tell you much or help very much, and also her English is horrible. Again, I will be fixing that, so look forward to fixes on that in the next few weeks. So I'm kind of indifferent to her, too. Um, but yeah, that's all I really have to say about Alice. Next is settlement enhancers, like um, tools... Uh, or, uh, I guess we get not tools, but uh, goblins, these things called steam automatons. They're supposed to increase your speed of production or lengthen your speed of production, but they also increase the cost by the same amount. So there's no real benefit to them. Their only benefit is that you can queue something up and it will go longer. So like if you if you queue up 10 items in a mine right now, they'll be done in about an hour. But maybe you're telling yourself, well, I want to go to bed and I want to have a whole bunch done overnight. Well, you can use those steam automaton things. I haven't really tested it very much, but you can use those. You can hit um, you, can, you can hit turn on or enhance or whatever it is. And then you can set these things to run for eight hours. They cost 10 times more, but they give you 10 times more too. So it, it, it prolongs the production process. It's fine. It's a good and, and a, it's not really a bad thing. It's just a not so interesting thing no not many people use it in fact i don't know anyone who uses it but it is there and then there's goblins which supposedly speed up production if you feed them you make these ration packs for them but i and most people have found that the process of making these packs is more time consuming than the benefit of using goblins so we just don't do it um hopefully they'll change it and make goblins more useful or have another way to increase the production of your settlement more simply but uh eh, i'm indifferent to it Last but not least, this is the last of the not really good or bad changes, are the lottery and strek races. Um, well, strek races aren't a change. Those have been around since we all started playing back in 16. Um, no one really participates in them. They're kind of not well defined, not not very well advertised. And there's nothing that pops up on your screen and says, hey, it, 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 get involved in the strike races and go earn gold. I think it'd be cool if the game gave you a strike to race in so you could experience the strike race. Or if they had something more interesting than fly from this city to this city. If the race was fly through all these rings or fly through all these flags and race other people through them like an actual racetrack, that would be fun. But currently the races are just fly a very long ways, sit around staring at your screen while it happens and hope you get there before everybody else. That's not a race, that's a marathon. <laughs> and it's not very fun at all. Um, other thing that they put in is the lottery. They have these lottery tickets that you can buy. Again, I keep referencing EVE because it's the closest kind of game to this. Um, you guys probably know the EVE lottery, which I think is a third play third party thing. It's not uh, not run by CCP. Well, it's, it's in this game, it is run by the developers. And every day this lottery system automatically pulls numbers if you pick X number of numbers, you get a bunch of silver, and the more numbers you match, the more silver you get. That sounds fine, but since there's so few people playing the game, the lottery doesn't really make much sense, and and buying tickets is somewhat cheap, but I don't know, it's, no one does it. I, I don't really see the point of having it in the game. So, I don't know. It, it, I'm not upset with it, or I don't hate it. I just don't care about it at all, and ne neither does anybody else, really. Um, okay, on to the next thing, bad changes. Now, I'm happy to say there's only four things on this list. There's only four things which I really don't like, which really bother me, but they don't necessarily bother everybody. Uh, I've talked to people who some of these things don't bother them at all. They don't think twice about them. So again, this is my opinion. If you disagree, that's okay. You're entitled to your opinion, even if it's the wrong one. Okay, bad changes. First one that I still am not happy about is new balloons have been reduced to where they can only fly 1.5 miles up or 1,500 yards. Again, their measurements are kind of wonky in this game, but uh, 1,500 on that little uh, compass on your left there, you'll know what I mean. Uh, it used to be they could go 4K and you could fly them anywhere in the world just about and you could transport small amounts of goods every, anywhere you wanted to and if you lost them, well, who cares? It's a new balloon. It's just It's not a big loss. Well, now... They only fly 1.5 miles, which means if you're a human and you're up in Baragor, you are very limited on how you get around to the other settlements because it's a very mountainous region. Um, I think that if they do change this, which they probably will never do, they should increase the human balloon's height to at least 2,000. 
they probably won't but i think it was a pointless change i know why they did it because they don't want people using noob balloons for official business they want just noobs to have it it's the equivalent of a minimum wage they want them to work at the minimum wage job and then quickly get out and go to a better one so i i understand why they did it i just don't like it i actually liked having new balloons having 4,000 feet or kilometers or what, whatever the heck they think it is and uh I'm just a little bummed about that it's not the end of the world though not a game breaker for sure next is split currencies this was probably the thing that was the straw that broke the Campbell's back. For those of us who sat through all these other negative changes that I've mentioned earlier, um, uh, the the increase of prices of everything, the uh, inability to make money in the game without making using real money, we were able to forgive all that. But when they put the two different currencies in, most of the rest of the remaining English speakers, minus maybe two people, left. I mean, they just left. They were done because they originally you could earn gold in the game or you could pay for gold but there was one currency so at least you had the illusion that you could make money in the game because it was the only currency there was well i don't really know why they did this but they split the currencies into two now there's silver which is the money you earn in game and can pay for most non-magic items and non-special ships or there is gold which you all remember gold, but now gold can only be used for things like um, uh, mana potions or crystals or anything that's in the magic list on the market. Also, you can buy that yacht that I mentioned earlier or the Toad K, a um, couple other things with gold. Of course, there's the portrait, which I'm totally cool with. That makes sense to pay real money for um, or creating new characters costs gold. So basically, they, they've made it so that you can now play the game without spending any real money because everything's available for silver but they've locked certain parts of the game behind gold um now before i before you get upset about this and you think okay here's the paywall here's where they locked the paywall and you have to pay money at this point well you don't there is a way around this that a lot of us players use um you can buy gold with the in-game currency and I know you've heard this before from like EA, you know, they say, oh, well, you, you don't have to pay real money for these loot boxes. You can use the money you earned in game. Um, it's it's kind of true. I am not fond of this, but it is possible now. At least it's possible to make it without ever paying money into the game. You can use silver and silver at the time that I'm recording this, the conversion ratio is roughly, uh, I'd say on average, 400 silver for one gold. So if you want, say... 100 gold in order to get a single 10 karat crystal you're looking at 40,000 silver that is somewhat attainable but not really in the early stages of the game so you're gonna end up buying one karat crystals it, it's there's ways to work around it there's ways to get by without paying real money but I still think that the gap between silver and gold is way too high and to be honest there's no purpose for two currencies because they're not kidding anybody you know, if you pay for gold and you end up transferring that into silver, why would the developers add this extra stage of bureaucracy, this extra stupid exchange rate that constantly changes depending on what players want to put money into? Why not just, if you're gonna make, if you're gonna let players buy in-game currency, which is essentially what they've done from day one, then just have one in-game currency. There's no need for two, you're just making people convert in their head or pull out their calculator and do some math okay well what's this really worth if i were to pay silver or what's this really worth if i were to pay gold it's it's pointless you're just giving us more work to do as the player i'm not saying it's impossible work we all do it but it's pointless it takes away from the fun it takes away from the fantasy of the game that we're in so i really hope they return it to single currency i i really don't know if they ever will they keep saying no no this is good this is a good system and they come up with some BS excuse as to why they think it's good. I don't buy it. No one else buys it, really. I don't. Maybe the Russians buy it because uh, I don't really talk to them. They don't speak my language. But um, I could tell you, all the players that speak English, they do not buy into this lie. Well, maybe it's not a lie. Maybe the developers really do believe that gold and silver are good separately. But most of us just laugh whenever they give us excuses as to why they can't change it back to single currency. So the only way to get this changed 
is to constantly complain about it on the forums get in there and say come on guys let's just get one currency if it's going to be silver let it be silver i'm even okay with them making this game a pay one time game like uh um oh what's what's that game that i <laughs> can't even remember the name of it but basically uh, there's it's where you buy the game 20 bucks let's say and then the in-game economy is all there. Everything costs the same currency. If you're going to spend any more money on this game that you just bought with your real money, it will be to do aesthetic things. Think of like Warframe, for instance, um, or you know any number of other successful free-to-play games. So I hope they change that model. I have no idea. They, they're not very communicative on if they like suggestions or if they're going to test things out. So best thing you can do is if you want them to go back to a single currency, just keep complaining on the forums. If they see a lot of people complaining, well, that's a lot of people who could be giving them money who aren't. And money talks, right? So there's that. And I, I could go on and on about that. That's probably my biggest pet peeve right now in the game. Thankfully, it's not keeping me from playing because there are plenty of ways around spending real money, which is great. Okay, last complaint. Not as big of a complaint. I was initially very upset about this. Now I, I don't really care. But uh, Strek prices, they used to be one or two gold, which would come out to 400 to 800 silver, which is still very reasonable. Well, now they're tens of thousands of silver, which is silly. You're not going to buy them from the NPCs for that price. You can make your own for much cheaper. I understand the reasoning behind why they did this. You could originally buy Streks for one gold, take them back to your castle or your settlement or whatever, and disassemble them and get a bunch of free components out of them then turn around and sell those components on the market for more than you paid for the Strek. Um, the developers th saw this as an exploit, which kind of makes sense, and they increased the, the price of the Streks. But my argument is it's only an exploit if people were willing to buy those engines. So if people were willing to buy those engines and parts for increased prices, that's their own fault. Why should the development team try to fix it and hold their hands? So, I mean, I'm not heartbroken about the Strek price increase. I was pretty bummed at the time because we frequently would buy Strex and take them apart for the pieces, not really to sell them, but because it would let us build Strex very quickly. Now, if I want to make an M4 engine, for instance, it's going to take something like uh, 27 hours or some stupid amount of time. And that's my, that's my other complaint. I actually don't have it on my list here, but it does remind me the time it takes to build anything in this game is god awful long. I mean, I'm building a blade to or a Toad 200 right now. It's 192 hours. I repeat, 192 hours to build a Toad 200. So let's see. Let me do a little math. You can probably hear me clicking on my keyboard. 192 divided by 24 hours. That's eight days. Eight freaking days to build one ship that can be killed fairly easily with some concerted effort. That is ridiculous. And if they're going to make crystals as expensive as they are, ships should not take over a week to make. That's, uh, that's just my opinion, obviously. So hopefully they change that. I really hope that they reduce the time it takes to make virtually anything in this game. I mean, everything in this game takes a ton of time to build. And it seems like that's the last thing that they've got left to change in order to catch up with all these other changes they've done, like Glide and other things that speed up the game and make it less of a waiting simulator and more of an actual airship game. If they speed up build times, that's my last time complaint. You won't hear me complain anymore about that. Anyway, folks, that is the end. This is probably the longest video I've ever made. 48 minutes by my count, probably a little longer by the time we're done. Um, that is listing absolutely every good, not so good, and bad change that has happened in this game. And as you just heard, there's a lot, lot more good changes than bad changes, which is a huge step in the right direction. I am, I am both unhappy, but mostly happy with the developers on what they've done in the past year. I really hope they continue this forward progress and listen to the communities. One of our biggest complaints is they hear our suggestions, but instead of saying, we hear your suggestion and we're going to fix that, they just say, oh, well, it actually supposed to be that way. You know, the whole, it's not a bug, it's a feature thing. Or they say, oh, well, here's a way around it. We don't need a way around it. If we've played the game long enough, we know how to work around bugs and difficult things in the game. What we want to hear is, hey, that's a good idea. We'll try it. Or no, we don't think that's a good idea. We probably aren't going to implement that. You know, that's a, a much more honest opinion than, uh... 
Well, it's a feature. That's just lying. We don't like lying. So, good changes overall. If Now, we're going to come to the end of this video, and here's the big question. Is this game worth playing now compared to what it was in 2016? If you were the kind of player who enjoyed the game in 2016 for what it was and thought, you know, the concept of this game is really cool, but everything about it as far as noob friendliness goes or ability to make it without paying money is just a total jacked up mess, then you will like the game in its current state. It is now playable. It still has bugs. It's luck catchers. I mean, we kind of all joke about the glitches and stuff in it. It still has problems and there still are things to fix. There always will be. But there are finally some really good signs of change in the game. I think it is worth playing if you've played it before and you left mainly due to the economy issues or due to the noob unfriendliness. The game is still fairly noob unfriendly because the tutorials don't exist except for my video tutorials. Um, it's like Eve was in the early days where you kind of had to just figure out what to do on your own, but that's sort of what makes the community in it so great. The community in the game right now is terrific because we're all players who have learned everything from the ground up and who are very willing to help other players learn too because it helps ourselves. This game excels with more and more player base and um, I can I can tell you from looking in the past, uh, in fact I'm going to I'm going to type it in right now and uh, I can tell you um, that the game has gained population. It has gained population over the past few months, which is a sign that it is it is uh, moving in the right direction. Now, it's kind of funny because the average players at their lowest were 17 players. That's not an MMO. That's a Battlefield 2 24 player map. <laughs> I mean, it was bad. This game, I thought the game would fail. I thought it would just disappear off the charts. The developers would go bankrupt and disappear. But they've somehow pulled through. I don't know how they're doing it because they can't be making much money right now. But they've pulled through and they've added a whole bunch of great changes into the game in this past year. At its lowest, it was 17.9 players. I'm looking at steamcharts.com. That was back in November, which was only a few months ago. That was mainly because most of the English speakers just didn't want to give it another try. And the reviews are pretty bad on Steam if you look at it. Its average is around 52, but the more recent reviews are all horrible. And uh, they, they were like weeks ago, months ago sometimes. Nobody, nobody's been trying the game anymore. Um, but December, we got to 22 players. Over the last 30, 30 days, we've hit 28 players. I know it sounds like a joke compared to any other MMO, even the less popular ones have thousands of players, like Age of Conan, for instance, which was once a great game. But uh, for these developers, that's a big deal. That's a 30% that's a gain month over month over the past few months, and I'm hoping that that, that continues on. We had the most peak players we've had since August 2017, so it's a sign that the developers are doing a better job, they're finally listening to their community, and if you want this game to have a lot of players, do you know how you do that? You play it, and you invite people to the game. I'm begging you, invite people into the game because it is so much better with a community. It is so much more awesome with a bunch of people playing it, and that is the only well, aside from the currency being screwed up, that is the only component that is now missing from the game as I speak that keeps it from going from some unknown game to a well-known game and a great game. If you've ever played EVE, you know about the really fun 0.0, .0 politics. Some people don't even play EVE, they haven't played for years, but they still like to read about all the crazy stuff that's happening in 0.0 space because there's so many players and it's like watching a... Um, a simulation of the real world, the way people interact and treaties come together and they're broken, all this cool stuff. Player content. This game is ripe for player content. I mean, absolutely ripe. This game could have so much player content. All it needs is players. And a year ago, I would have said, don't touch this game with a 10-foot stick. It is not ready for players. It shouldn't have ever been released. But at this point that I'm making this video, yes. The game is ready for players. It still has some flaws. It's still gonna scare a lot of people away because it's a very unique game for a very specific type of player, but at least that specific type of player can now enjoy this game. So I'm gonna close this video with saying, give it another try. 
If you hated this game before because it's just not the type of game you like, you're still not going to like it because it's always going to be an airship game on a huge open map. Everything's going to take a while. But if you're that other player who liked it, who liked the idea of it, but hated the execution, come back, give it a try, hop on our Discord. I'll link that here in uh, the YouTube channel as well. Give it a go. Ask questions. Don't try to play solo. There's people out there who want to help. More importantly, if you're hearing this review, you speak English, you you need to find an English speaking community because there are very few of us. It's a Russian made game. I'm probably going to do another video of the history of this game, why the game failed initially back in November 2016 or more specifically December. But for this video, I think we've done it. I think I've explained to you. I think the game is worth trying again. Huge changes in the past year and I hope to see you in game. And I think that's all I have to say. So I will see you guys out there. Hopefully I'll see you on Discord or you can comment here on YouTube. And of course, put in my code before you put in anyone else's code below you. Otherwise, it locks you out from getting the rewards of having someone above you. And I'm stingy. I want your gold. See y'all later.